Hello, and welcome to another episode of Cooking with Bryson. Logistics, reminder, throw your questions into the Q&A down on the chat, and we will get to them. Today's guest chef is the one, the only, Carl Keritz, also Cosmos, also, uh, do you pronounce it Silic? Is that your- um, Silly C. As in Silly Carl, Silly C. Oh, Silly C, you're Silly C. Ah, I've I've been wondering about that. (laughs) <laughs> no one gets it right. No one gets it right. In fact, Lintile uh, does it intentionally now. Now that he knows what it is, he still calls me Silic all the time. So I didn't know it was Silly C. So um, Carl Hertz, aka Cosmos, aka Silly C, who is also kindly offering um, a total $500 match to his charity of this week, which is the Brave Spaces Alliance. Um, Carl, welcome to the show. And what are we making? Uh, hi, thank you, Bryson. Uh, it's awesome to be here. Uh, this week, I am going to be making uh, fake cassoulet, essentially, a very fast cassoulet, um, which in the end is nothing but French beanies and weenies. Um, but it's still an amazingly tasty dish. Uh, cassoulet, if you have ever made it, um, is usually a multi day affair. Um, it involves all kinds of fancy ingredients, fancy for here. Um, but it's peasant food in the end. It's stew, right? Um, I'm not even going to bake it. Traditionally, it's baked. We're just going to do it on the stovetop. Um, this is a recipe that uh, I got the idea for this from uh, Jacques Pepin. Uh, he did a book in a series on PBS called Fast Food My Way. And uh, his was o- almost devastatingly uh, simple and American. Um, and I was like, well, we can make this a little bit more interesting, but still keep it ridiculously fast. Um, so with some other cassoulet, actual cassoulet recipes and stuff, I've just kind of thrown this together over time. And it's, uh, it's really more of a framework than a recipe, because quite frankly, as a stew, you're, you're throwing meat and beans in a pot in the end. So you, it, 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 there's a lot of wiggle room to play around with it. Yeah, I like, I like to call things that you would like when you say peasant, I think it's more fancy to call it rustic. In fact, uh, since your recipe yeah. required us to dice onions, I call it rustic when I do more of like a, a, a rough chop. <laughs> yep. I was like, it's rustic, it's country style. Yeah, we're not, in, or we could do bespoke where, you know, we're running it through some sort of fine grain thing. And yeah, no, no, this is really, uh, again, uh, it, I don't know if uh, for people who looked at the, uh, the little blurb I put on the internet, you know, the story was, this was a wartime dish. Literally, they found what food they could find while their city was under siege and threw it in a pot. And then it was like, oh, wow, this doesn't suck. <laughs> so. So, all right, we got a question. What's the difference between a cassoulet and a casserole? Uh, literally, the dish. Uh, so, cassoulet, the, uh, cassoulet uh, is cooked in something called a casserole, which is an earthenware pot that is... Uh, a casserole usually has upright sides and a casserole is kind of got, uh, it's it's a cone uh, with the bottom flattened out. Um, so why? Who knows? Uh, go to Languedoc in Southern France and I'm sure there will be more than enough people to argue with you uh, on why and what the dimensions should be and all that fun stuff. But literally it's not a casserole dish, it's a casserole dish. And cassoulet is literally just a stew made in a casserole. Awesome. What are you drinking? Uh, I am drinking um, basically a a really lazy version of tea punch. Um, So instead of white agricole rum, it's a dark agricole rum. Um, Instead of uh, cane simple syrup, uh, since I didn't have any cane syrup, uh, I actually, Heather, my wife, had just made some... uh, simple syrup with black peppercorns in it, uh, and then a squeeze of lime juice. So simple, easy, tasty. All right, well, cheers. I'm drinking a Founders All Day IPA Session Ale. And let's get cooking. Good stuff. Let's get cooking, folks. Awesome. So we're going to start off over here. I need to change something up here. So uh, as I mentioned before, or as I mentioned in the instructions, uh, we're, we have a little bit of pre-prep done because we're limited for time on this, uh, though even with that, 
we probably could have gotten through this uh, without uh, doing the pre-prep work because it is so fast. Um, so I'm using raw sausages rather than dried sausages for this. Um, I, uh, my local butcher happened to have Italian sausages and andouille today. Uh, so that's what I'll be using. Um, so I'm going to... I am using beer brats because I forgot that sausages was in the recipe and that's all I had in the freezer. Hey, I use beer brats all the time for this. So um, they just happen to have some... Uh, I'm going to pull these out of the bath. Uh, for those of you who throw your sausages on the grill raw, bad, bad, don't do it. That's how you get exploding sausages that have, uh, you know, huge rips in them or uh, are raw in the middle and cooked uh, uh, and only cooked on the outside. Um, if you want, when you're grilling sausages, always give them a bath first. Uh, you're not fully cooking them, but you're cooking them to the point so that when you are uh, putting them low and slow on the grill, you can actually caramelize that outer skin a little bit and uh, not be raw in the middle and leave it on the grill for a long time. Or you can flash cook it, which is more of what we're gonna be doing in the pot today here. So I'm just gonna give these a rough cut real quick. And again, nothing accurate here because this is stew. We're not going for anything. Ooh, that one exploded. We're not going for anything fancy. Rustic, excuse me. I, I gotta remember that one. <laughs> my, my kids will, will be flattered with or, or impressed with knowing that they're eating rustic food. Yeah, I mean calling uh, it peasant, I feel like the kids are gonna be like, we're not peasants. We're not peasants. <laughs> yes, you are. You're, you're part of the proletariat and enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> um so just again, a quick cut. We're not going to dice it up or anything crazy at this point. No, don't fall on the floor. That one I'm going to have to clean off. All right. So uh, now that we've got those cut up, I am actually going to throw a little bit of oil in the pot. Let's point this over here. And we're going to go and cook our bacon actually on high heat, uh, not low heat. Uh, we're because we're not going to cook. Hmm? We're throwing the bacon in? Yeah, we're going to throw the bacon in next. Uh, so oil, a little bit of oil in the pot. Uh, and then we're going to throw our bacon in. Uh, I've got mine uh, pre-cut into just one inch pieces. Again, nothing uh, too big. You can put it in a hole uh, and crumble it up later. Uh, again, it's stew and it's a very forgiving dish. Uh, so we're going to heat up our pot a little bit here. Uh, and again, we're going to cook the bacon on high heat instead of low heat. This isn't your breakfast bacon. Uh, we're literally just adding some porky, smoke, porky smoky flavor to our dish. Uh, Plus, we get the fat from the bacon. Yep, we get a little extra fat from the bacon. This is not a low-fat dish. Uh, for By the way, if, if you've ever had real cassoulet, um, I know a lot of American ones actually will have like a breadcrumb topping to give it a crispy top. That's not real cassoulet real cassoulet gets crispy on top because of all the fat um you know when you have fat rise to the top on your slow cooker or whatever when you bake it in the oven it actually forms a shell and traditional cassoulet multiple times uh, there's some people that say even like seven or more times you pull it out of the oven you crack that hardening fat on top and stick it back in the oven to just get more and more of that hard shell so you're actually eating crunchy fat. Um, so again, uh, for those of you who uh, are not capable of doing a high fat diet, this is definitely not a dish for you. But it's what makes it so tasty. It is, fat is what tastes good. Alrighty, I've got some, uh, some heat coming in here. I'm gonna throw my bacon in. And again, that's gonna go in for about two minutes. We're not cooking it all the way. We are just cooking it enough before we put our chicken in. So have your chicken thighs ready. Um, and how much chicken you put in, uh, or if you're not going to do chicken, if you're going to do pork shoulder, um, 
really depends on the size of your um, Dutch oven that you're cooking in uh, because we are Does wanting to brown it really well. Go ahead. Does our chicken need to be cut? No, the chicken needs to, it can go in a hole. And you can use, uh, I would just recommend uh, uh, with the skin off, as much as I love uh, chicken skins, um, this dish has enough fat in it already. Uh, you can do it bone in. Uh, bone in actually gives it a lot better flavor. But again, I'm doing this as more of a rapid dish and you need to deal with the bones and the cartilage afterwards, especially when you have picky kids in your household like I do. So uh, I'm just doing skinless, boneless. Obviously, traditionally, uh, this dish usually uses some sort of fowl. Um, most people are, uh, when they cook it or see it cooked, it usually has duck, uh, duck confit in it. Uh, again, we're doing a fast cassoulet and I ain't got no time to make a confit. Um, though fortunately my, uh, I, I almost thought about uh, just cheating my butcher that I got the sausages from today I actually had some pre-made duck confit um, in the fridge over there. But I was like, no, I'm gonna stick with the chicken for today. If you are using duck, if you're so fortunate that I already have some duck confit and you're making this, I would skip the bacon. Uh, the bacon fat and the duck fat, uh, two very competing flavors of fat, I think, um, and wouldn't necessarily be the best way to do the cassoulet. Yeah, I think I think you're gonna the bacon is gonna overwhelm the flavor of the duck. Um, duck fat is I, very subtle. I made duck last weekend. And unfortunately, I also made poutine, so I used up all of my duck fat. Ah, yeah. But I was saying so about that. Like, oh, I should have just saved like a teaspoon for this. Yep. So duck fat is uh, something. There's a place called the Hot Duds here in Chicago for a long time, which was a gourmet hot dog shop. Uh, and on weekends, they would do their fries and duck fat. And there would be a line around the block to get those fries. All righty, I've got a little bit of, you know, starting to crisp up a little bit and I'm going to turn my heat down just a little bit. Uh, I happen to have a, a stove that throws off some decent BTUs, so I'm not going to go full high, but I'm going to start putting my chicken thighs in the bottom. We are going to put it at one layer on the bottom of your uh, Dutch oven. So another question, um, what el what other meats have you made this with? I'm sorry, what was that? What other meats have you made this with? Um, I usually do, well, I've done it with duck. I've done it with pork shoulder, Boston butt, whatever you want to call it. Um, I've done it with chicken. Um, I have not yet done with mutton because, uh, which is also a traditional ingredient. Mutton? It's kind of hard to come by in America. Um, it's, you know, um, you find lamb everywhere, but mutton is not popular in America. So a lot of butchers don't carry it. Um, also, the definition of mutton varies by where you are in the world, right? Of how old the sheep is. So uh, again, I've not done it with mutton. It's something I've wanted to try because again, that is very traditional. I haven't done it. Okay, so we've got our chicken thighs in the bottom of the Dutch oven um, in one layer. I'm going to so that. Just make sure that they have one layer that they're uh, not laying on top of each other. I'm going to have to move one there. And we're not going to touch it for four minutes. Just let it cook for four minutes. And then we're going to start my timer here. We're just going to let that go. And then we're going to flip them in four minutes. All right. This is, I this need is to wash part of cooking. Hand hand cooking hand just hand not hand What? Oh, you're washing your hands? Yeah, we're all chicken on my hands. Just washing them. <laughs> Hygiene is the most important part of cooking. If it's good at what you eat, but it still poisons you, it doesn't, doesn't work. Yeah, that's bad. That's always bad. 
So this is one of our points to sit and wait. What do you want to talk about, Bryson? Yeah, no. So uh, I saw on Twitter that you have been uh, biking pretty hard these days. Yeah, well, I, I need to be doing more, that's for sure. But yeah, I did a little scientific experiment uh, of, uh, I was just curious for myself because, you know, wearing a mask all day, especially while working out, um, can be uncomfortable. And uh, I know there's a lot of BS disinformation going on. So I happen to have a, a pulse oximeter and I wanted to check my oxygen levels at different points, right? Get a baseline, um, do a max heart stress, go for a long cruise, everything. And it didn't change. And I was wearing a heavy mask the whole time. So yeah, wear a mask people. I did, uh, <laughs> I did a 1700 calorie workout with a mask on. So. <laughs> what do you, uh, are you, are you actually going, do you have to go to an office or you get to work from home? Uh, I've been working from home for about a year actually. So oh, wow. uh, um, the organization I work for uh, is uh, starting to expand to be a national organization. So we had actually just recently implemented a, um, uh, infrastructure to allow everyone to work from home or work remotely anyway, as we look to expand and decentralize. So uh, we were fortunate. Timing worked out that everything was in place so that we were able to make a call very early on in early March and just say, okay, everyone, go home, get your stuff, go home. So we were working from home a couple of weeks before there were any orders to do so. So we got pretty lucky with that. But yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's worked out pretty well. Security is interesting, to say the least. The changes uh, of uh, what your threat model looks like from, you know, 90% of your people working in one place to 100% not working in that place anymore. Uh, so, yeah, uh, there's been a lot of uh, uh, mistakes on the back end of, oh, wait, we just... Now people can't do that. Okay, we need to figure out something else. Uh, but it's been it's been a fun challenge. So, um, what what exactly do you do? What do I do? Okay, well, I am the what director. Of, <laughs> <laughs> so I am the director of IT and cybersecurity for a nonprofit organization called Elevate Energy. We're a green energy company that focuses on bringing. Um, the green economy to low-income and at-risk communities. And actually with COVID, our mission has changed a bit more. Um, we are actually doing things uh, on top of, because a lot of the construction work we did, the retrofit building to make them more energy efficient is on hold because it's not critical. Um, a lot of what those people are doing are working with the cooling centers to make them safe for elderly people and, and people who uh, are at risk from heat stroke in their apartments. Uh, we are doing grocery deliveries for the elderly. Um, we are doing water deliveries. Uh, we're literally just in the communities trying to keep people fed, hydrated, and cool in low-income communities right now. On top of our regular work. <laughs> Is there an operational technology aspect to that or Yes, less than what you'd think. Um, again, because of the fact that we have 100% cloud infrastructure already, um, a lot of the stuff we just build out based on, we happen to be in a uh, Microsoft Azure's ecosystem. Uh, so we use a lot of their tools and hookins to uh, products that we had already built standalone to make them uh, cloud apps and stuff. Um, and it's just, it's laptops, tablets, and, and custom software and cloud services that we do it all with, essentially. Uh, I did not set my timer right. Let's slip this. <laughs> I did it for three hours. It took about four minutes. Yep. Nah, it looks good. I'll uh, show you what it looks like in mine as soon as we're done here. And it's okay if it sticks a little bit to the bottom, because quite frankly, 
We're wanting this chicken to be falling apart at the end, so any kind of browned bits. The one thing that did get a little overdone in mine was the bacon. I'm going to turn mine down a little bit. Now give everyone a quick look. Uh, nice brown. So is this uh is this another four minutes on the timer? Another four minutes? Yep. So um at this point, make sure you have a plate with some paper towels because we're gonna pull that chicken off. We're gonna pull the chicken out after four minutes. So what got you into InfoSec? Uh, interestingly enough, I didn't choose it, it chose me. So I was working in the uh, energy sector, uh, but at a utility. Uh, IT service desk. Uh, uh, been, I'd been doing it for a while at that point. Um, I had actually been a manager previously, but I had moved to the city that I was doing this in and kind of had to start over a little bit. Um, so I was a team lead on the service desk and um, the security department's like, hey, um, we, need some, we need someone else to help us out with security provisioning which is still an infrastructure role. It's not a cybersecurity you know, policy role or anything. Um, so I'm still dealing mostly with Active Directory and stuff, but basically um, implementing uh, the security that they had decided, you know, whatever uh, policies that they wanted to roll out. I was the person who was, who was dealing with the active provisioning of that stuff inside of Active Directory. Uh, and then, uh, so if you, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the utility space at all, of course you are. Um, we have the nuclear power plant and um, nuclear power plants have to refuel about every 18 months. Uh, and when they refuel, uh, they go from a population of about 300 people to a population of about 10,000 people for a period of a few weeks. Because the only time you can do a lot of things at a nuclear power plant is when it's not boiling water. Right. For 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 the boiling water aspect and the whole, you know, radioactivity aspect. Uh, so. There's a lot of security that is involved with bringing the population from 300 to 10,000 back to 300. So uh, they asked me to help out with that because of my role in uh, doing security provisioning for the organization as a whole. Uh, and that's really kind of what got me into cybersecurity. Uh, was watching that whole process uh, and, and really like, okay, why are we doing it this way? What, you know, wait, you're allowing them to do this, but not them, you know, and, and asking questions and really seeing, you know, the, the sausage get made on why the decisions were being made that were being made. Um, because in the end, they put me on the overnight shift to be the person who had to make judgment calls on, on specific security requests. So I had to really beef up my understanding on um, not just security, but NERC and FERC and all kinds of crazy stuff um, in order to be able to make the right kind of judgment calls as to whether or not... Uh, explain what NERC and FERC is. Most people don't know what that is. Uh, NERC and FERC? Sorry. Uh, regulatory... Uh, let's just put, I'll just leave it at the nasty regulatory stuff in the energy sector. Uh, that uh, if uh, you've ever had to deal with SOX compliance, SOX has nothing on NERC and FERC. <laughs> so there's one that tells you the best way to do it, and then there's one that's a stick. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, I mean... And the two don't necessarily align either. <laughs> so we're at our four minutes. Um, I'm going to turn my camera off before it goes off. I'm going to turn my heat down real quick just to make sure I don't solve what's on the bottom of my pot too much. Um, yeah, at a nuclear power plant, 
if a coffee cup gets left out someplace it shouldn't be, it's an incident, a full on incident with major investigation and lessons learned and all kinds of fun stuff. Um, everything in its place in a nuclear power plant. Yeah. Oh, this is already looking great, and we haven't even gotten to the sausages yet. Oh, we weren't supposed to have already thrown the sausages in? Oh, did you put sausage in? <laughs> yeah, I had, I had the what? chicken. I was wondering why my chicken wasn't cooking as well as yours. I actually threw mine in to, to do it. It's because the sausage ah, kind of raised up off the yeah, oil. The, the sausage was just cut before, not, not thrown in. So chicken and slightly overcooked bacon, but that'll be fine because again, it's a stew, it's very forgiving. You know, set that aside. Forgive me. <laughs> if you need to, uh, if you obviously keep doing what you're doing, you can do everything at once. It just doesn't brown as well, yeah. right? Um, but uh, in fact, Jacques Fafan's recipe, like the way he does it and the timing he has, I never got it to work, like, because he's putting everything in at once, and I'm like, how do you how do you brown anything? Okay, so uh, so at this point, chicken's out, uh, and uh, what am I doing? I'm doing sausages now. So I'm going to take all those. All I already have sausages going. Yep. <laughs> I am. I am also working on browning my chicken over here on the side because I didn't quite get that brown since I did on top of the sausages. <laughs> so I will I will keep up with you, no doubt. No problem. Next in yeah. So again, the sausages we are just browning. Uh, there's no time on this one. Um, now that my sausages are in, I'm going to kick the heat back up. Actually, this is so pretty now. I need to share it. There you go. That's my that's my golden. Nice. That looks good. So and we're going to let those brown for a few minutes. What's that? That we're going to let just let those brown for a few minutes more here. Okay. And oops, I just absolutely messed up my camera image. Here, let's uh, press that button. For those of you watching live, no, you aren't on acid. That was actually a function of my camera. Um, and while that's going, what am I going to cut up? Uh, mushrooms. Okay, I use pre-diced mushrooms, uh, but I need to chop my uh, onion and my garlic at this point. So, garlic simple. Oh, that shouldn't have gone under there. I like your sand token. My uh, garlic is being extra playful and running around everywhere. I realize it's not even on camera what I'm doing. There we go. Very nice on meats. Again, just because we're doing rustic, we're not looking for even anything very special with the garlic. Yeah, I mean, anytime you're throwing everything together and just a whole bunch, you definitely don't need a precision cut ever. Yep. Because it all just melts together, like you're pulling the flavors together. It's only when yep. you're trying to be really particular with specific bites you have to worry about that. And this meal is just a whole bunch of deliciousness that all just works on itself. I'm very excited about it and I'm getting hungry. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. That's how I know it's a good episode is when I start getting hungry during the show. <laughs> yeah, um, again, you you can thank Jacques Pepin for the whole, hey, you know what? Castellet doesn't have to take three days. So. 
I'm, uh, I've been happy with this. I've been cooking this one for, oh, maybe 10 years now. So the thing about confit is confit is not hard to make. It just is a time thing. But it's, it's also a not time. an time thing. You just kind of throw it and leave it for a long period exactly. of time. There is nothing about cassoulet, the regular cassoulet, that is hard. It just takes time. Yeah. Um, sourcing ingredients can be harder. You know, if you're not in a big city, getting duck can be hard, right? Um, but, it, you know, and if you're going for actual traditional ingredients, you know, it can be really hard because the French sausages, yeah, I mean, we can get andouille, but, you know, getting sausage to pay and stuff like that, good luck, right? Unless you're making it yourself. In which case, if you are making it yourself, send some to me. <laughs> so, sausage yeah, making yeah, is something I would love to get into. Yeah, no, sausage, sausage making takes a lot of effort and you yes. need specific tools to do it. But and you have to be super clean. Confit, you just throw it, leave it, and then the thing is, it keeps forever. So it's the kind Ever. of thing you can make a bunch of it and it's just covered in the fat and the fat just like creates a seal and you can just leave it in your fridge and it will last for a long time. Yep, it's uh, it, it's quite tasty and it's quite simple. Uh, it just again time consuming, um, you know. And yeah, you know, I don't even do the thing where you like twist the thigh bone up and you know, yeah, it looks cool, but I, I don't need to do that. I just want to eat it. It's tasty. Yeah, I'm not fancy. I'm not fancy. <laughs> I do what tastes good and doesn't take a lot of time for it to taste good. So how's your sausage? How's your sausage and chicken looking? Are you ready? I am, yep. Yeah. Alrighty, I'm gonna throw my chicken back in. Are we throwing the chicken in again? Throwing the chicken back in, yep. Okay. Yeah. Ungracefully thrown on the counter. Uh, and what are we doing? Onion, garlic. Thyme, bay leaf. Oh, I forgot to write the tomatoes in here. Do you have tomatoes? I do. In fact, talking about doing something in advance. Uh, I could see actually again, quartz cut, a rustic cut. So I I smoked Roma tomatoes over um, bourbon wood or bourbon soaked oak. Oh, nice. And so I've just been keeping them in my fridge. I'm like, well, I'm just going to use those. Yeah. Just eat those. Oh, that's something I was going to do. I made uh, yesterday. I made uh, I made carnitas tacos, and I was actually yeah, going to yeah, throw I some carnitas that. in here, and yeah. I forgot. So, are we throwing? The, I'm throwing the tomatoes in. Yeah, throw the tomatoes in now too. And the garlic. I throw. Am I throwing everything in? You're throwing everything in at this point. Yep. I'm going to throw in my garlic and onion first because I want it to get to the bottom to. Yep. Caramelize more. Yeah, normally I don't bother caramelizing with this dish um, because there's enough big flavor in there already. But you certainly can spend as much time as you want, like you could do the bacon and then do the onions on super low and actually caramelize them, you know, and then pull the onions and re-add them later. Um, if you wanted true caramelized onions, um, again, this this recipe is much more of a framework. Um, we want to, oh, well, actually the tomatoes were in the next step, but they'll be fine on this one, sorry. This is just going four to six minutes. We're just basically heating up, sweating up the onions and the garlic and the mushrooms and uh, using some of that sweat to scrape up some of the brown bits that are on the bottom of your pot from cooking all that meat. Uh, 
and we'll uh, just give people a peek over here again. While that's going, I'm going to pour myself a little more rum. Just a reminder, donate to our charity, Brave Spaces Alliance. The link will be has been Brave posted on Twitter a couple of times, but we will post it on the registration page. Brave Space, singular, one Brave space. space. Brave Alliance. Space Alliance. They, they make one space brave at a time. <laughs> so uh, just a, a quick rundown on who Brave Space Alliance are. They are a community organization here in Chicago that works specifically with the intersection of uh, black and trans population, um, providing them uh, with uh, shelter, job training, all kinds of stuff, and obviously, um, with COVID having such a massive impact, a disproportionate impact on the poor and on Blacks in America, uh, and especially when you consider um, how discriminated against uh, transgender population is, they're spending a, a lot of time actually working as a food bank for the transgender population uh, in Chicago as well with, with the uh, African-American uh, transgender population. So. Oh, that so smells so good. You, how did you come around to creating CocktailCon? Ha! Huh. Funny you should ask. So CocktailCon, um, for those of you who aren't aware, uh, John Orleans, who's uh, Beer Bikes Bacon on Twitter, and myself, uh, were roomies for summer camp last year. And we we're like literally, you know, making a Google calendar of... Def Con. <laughs> yeah, oh, yes. <laughs> for those of you... Uh, not in the industry, Summer Camp, DEF CON, B-Sides Las Vegas, Black Hat, all that fun stuff, Diana Initiative, all these conferences that pile into Vegas. Um, so uh, I was gooning, he was speaking, um, all kinds of stuff. So we were trying to figure out our schedules and we're, you know, all these parties that we're getting invited to or wanted to go to, and we're looking at all this and it's like, wouldn't it just be better if we could get everyone to come to our place? So laziness was the idea behind CocktailCon, um, but we didn't want like the usual rager party, right? So we're like, hey, you know what? Let's actually teach people how to make some cocktails, um, make it a, kind of a smaller space. Um, we uh, got a suite at the Cosmopolitan, which has the really nice balconies. Um, so we, you know, we had about 30 or 40 people in a night every night during uh, DEF CON and uh, taught people how to make cocktails and had this nice little cocktail party. And uh, we're like, that was it. That was amazing. Um, and then this year, people or uh, other conferences were like, you're, you're going to do cocktail con at our conference, right? And we're like, <laughs> um, so we actually had plans to um we, were, we have sponsorship lined up. We were going to make it a bigger thing. And um, yeah, unfortunately, uh, this whole crazy COVID thing happened. So uh, another thing that John and I do together, is, along with uh, Silicon Checky, um, is we run a Loop InfoSec Happy Hour, which is a once, once a month happy hour uh, that was on Tuesday nights here in Chicago um, to try to uh, be a lot like BurbSec. Um, but also uh, have it a little bit smaller than BurbSec. For those who aren't familiar, BurbSec is kind of the, the big local meetup here in Chicago um, that happens. There's a BurbSec every Thursday, or there was pre-COVID. Um, so, but there weren't anything, there wasn't anything downtown. So we wanted to do something downtown to get people who may not uh, be familiar with BurbSec and uh, may be newer in the industry to give them the opportunity to have a social space uh, or get into the InfoSec space uh, socially. So that was on Tuesdays. And so John's like, hey, um, why don't we do, um, why don't we do CocktailCon on a Tuesday? 
and we did it. We uh, Jack Daniels was our first keynote speaker, and we had a bunch of speakers lined up, and everyone liked it so much, they're like, let's do it next week. And we've been doing it every week since. I think we're on week 13 now. <laughs> so that that that's uh, escalated quickly. I know. I was uh, I was at the first online one. So uh, Josh Foreman already points out that's not laziness; it's efficiency. And it's I have efficient. to agree because most of the community events that I've hosted, that's what they started with. I was like, well, it's more convenient if like everything worked this way. And then everybody was like, oh, thank you so much for doing that. And I was like, yeah, I did it because it was easier for me. <laughs> <laughs> so and then you uh, keep doing it. So if you're ready for the next step, so we're not going too long here because we've already we're actually already spent it, you know, because we're talking, spending more time and get but you know, more time is great with this dish. So that's fine. Um we're not ruining anything. Now we're going to go ahead and add our tomatoes, if you didn't already add them, um our beans and some liquid. Uh, the liquid can just be plain old water, half cup of water. I like using a stock of some sort. I happen to, in the fridge, have a opened container of chicken stock, so I'm just going to pour some of that in here. And again, the point of the stock, you know, we're going to keep the heat going here, and it's going to reduce and it's going to get a lot of that fat and starch and start making not really a sauce but you're going to it's not going to be like a traditional again cassoulet but you're definitely going to get some of that gooey unction unctuousness out of having some stock in there and all the flavors blending in with that stock and it thickening up And again, uh, you've got a little more liquid in there now. Work, uh, work the bottom of your pot. Get all that browned goodness off your pot and into your sauce. What about the bay leaves? Do we throw in bay leaves now? Yep, we're gonna throw in our bay leaf and our thyme. And this is what we got. You're, uh, we're throwing our thyme in whole. We're going to remove it. Yep, I'm throwing it in whole. You can spend the time to pick the leaves off. But I found that it really, because there's a sauce, right, um, it, it, it's going to flavor it nicely, just like the bay leaf will, without having to uh, leave it in whole. If you don't have access to fresh, fresh thyme, um, just remember, you can use dried thyme. When you're using dried herbs, generally the uh, ratio is, uh, if it calls for a teaspoon of dry, or if it calls for a tablespoon of uh, fresh, use a teaspoon of dried, uh, because the flavor is more intense in, in dried herbs. So, um, you know, so you obviously... Cover hmm? We cover this? Let it cook? Nope, you don't need to cover it. Again, we want the sauce to thicken, and it, let, well, let me let me correct that. If you want this to sit, like if you've got a half hour till dinner time, yeah, cover it, right, uh, so that it doesn't, uh, so the liquid doesn't boil off too quickly. Um, but turn your heat all the way down if you're going to do that. Uh, I am going to, uh, since we got another 15 minutes on our show here, I'm going to leave mine uncovered and just let it cook down. Uh, because again, the whole point of this is to do this quickly. This is a fast dish. Um, and be, again, because we've been talking, um, this normally would have been done by now. Uh, and it's essentially done, but the more you can, you know, the, the more you can let this thicken up, uh, the better the final product is going to be. Uh, and again, if you wanted to do this more like a traditional cassoulet, you could stick this in the oven at that point, at this point, if you had the time. But we're not bothering with that. We're just having fun. And uh, essentially, this is the final product. The longer you cook it down, the more intense those flavors are going to uh, come together. Uh, the more delicious those flavors. 
the deliciousness. Yes, all the fat with the extra fat and the more fat. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> I can't believe that. <laughs> Um, so serving, let's talk about serving since we, uh, I don't know if you're going to, yours is going to be done. Actually, it probably should be done, uh, before plating it up. Um, and this comes directly from Jacques Pepin. Um, and I don't know if people in Long with Doc would, uh, draw on for you for doing this. Um, but he serves it up with Dijon mustard and hot sauce, like a vinegar hot sauce. I mean, I'll, I'll just say Tabasco because everyone thinks Tabasco sauce, but that kind of hot sauce. Yes, and it is amazing like that. Um, you don't have to, um, but I thought that was, you know, I, I'm not going to argue with him. He's a, he's a master chef. And in his, uh, his version of this in Fast Food My Way, where I kind of started this from, he says, use daisy ham, which is the ham you go to the deli counter, right? So, you know, Again, he, he's much more fast and free with American ingredients. Um, but, you know, also keep in mind that when he came to America, he said the only way you could get mushrooms was in a can. So when he came to America in the, in the early 70s, and I kind of remember that be, being someone who's um, up there in age. I remember, you know, the produce section at the Jewels here was, you know, lettuce and carrots and tomatoes and apples. And that's about it. I, uh, so one, um, the, the mustard thing, I can get behind that. Um, the hot sauce, I think would have to be individual because I know, um, the end of every one of my shows, the greatest critic I have to deal with is my teenage daughter mm -hmm. and, uh, she does not do hot and spicy. Yeah. So, and my kids, uh, my kids aren't into hot and spicy either. And obviously, you know, there's a large difference in, dif in different hot sauces and how much vinegar there is to it. So if you want to get a little bit of that vinegar taste to it without it being hot, you know, you could probably hit it with a splash of sherry vinegar or something um, just to get a, a little bit of that sharpness, uh, a little bit of that acid um, to the flavor. But it doesn't require it. I happen to enjoy spicy food. So sometimes I hit it with the hot sauce, sometimes I don't. So um, this is also an amazing leftover dish. Mm -hmm. uh, most do's are. Um, it's, it's funny, I actually, um, the other day, we were just going through the freezer and like, oh, wow, I've got uh, beef stew in the freezer. I don't remember how old that is, and, and it, but still heat it up. And it's like, oh, God. <laughs> just stews that sit are always better, which is why while this dish is great as a fast dish, if you can slow it down and spend more time on it, it gets even better. Yeah, no, things like this, you, the, the longer they sit, the more the flavors work together and you just end up with something that passively tastes better. It's, it's almost better the next day even. Yep. So take a look here. You can see, let me adjust my camera. You can see the chicken's already falling apart which is what we want. You can see bottom of the pot is basically deglazed for the most part. You can see that my chicken stock no longer looks like chicken stock. It's getting nice and thickened. And, and quite frankly, this is ready to go. I'm gonna turn it off. And that is, Cassoulet rapide. A little plate here. So a lot of times when I serve this for the family, though, they ate already because the boys can't eat this late without having meltdowns because um, they're younger. Uh, I oftentimes I'll throw this on a big platter, right? Because um, it's a pretty dish uh for being just a, a stew i'm gonna pick up a little bit of this yes and don't mind the fact that the uh plate says poison it is not poison 
Hold on, I will plate mine. Awesome. And this is one that isn't, again, you're going to put it on a plate and it's just going to look like mush. And that's absolutely what it's supposed to look like. Uh, if you uh, have ever had cassoulet, then you have to crack the top out of it to get at it. And it's got chunks of hardened, solidified fat on it and in it. Um, it is not uh, a fancy looking dish at all. It is just pure it's tasty. It's rustic. <laughs> and it's rustic, yes. All right, hold on. I got my parsley here ready. I'm showing you mine, Bryson. Show me yours. I will. We're gonna. In fact, we're gonna do a screenshot here to share it. <laughs> Hold on. Throwing on my parsley from the garden. Oh, that's what I didn't grab. Parsley. Oh well. Yours is gonna look much nicer. That's the point of the parsley. Is that final little whatever that covers the fact that the rest of it is just a rustic melange. Rustic man. Oh, 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 oh. All right, hold on. I, I said, now now you have lost your French demographic. <laughs> All right. Ah, hold on. You lost them at rapid cassoulet, actually. So. All right. Um, get get your face in the shot, man. Oh man. That's gonna be fun. Oh, I see how you're doing this. Yep. Your camera is a much better color adjustment than mine. There we go. Hey. Bon appetit. Bon appetit. Oh, I'm so hungry. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Uh, you gotta take a bite. It's my fork. Uh, mm. All right. Take a bite. Got the pepper. Oh well, still tastes good. Mmm. Yeah, it doesn't need a little pepper. No. Mmm. Yeah, no, I and can. Oh, there's layers of it. I can taste what yep. you're gonna go with the more it cooks too. Yep. Um, and again, uh, if you want to spend more time on it, things you can do differently dried beans you know cook them and soak them or soak them properly like with onion and stuff to add more flavor to the beans um as i mentioned um traditionally there is duck confit uh there is mutton uh on top of uh the pork sausages um if you don't want to do pork you could do chicken sausages you know again uh the the dish allows you to play around uh, and uh, do whatever you want on the meat side. Um, I personally like doing a richer stock um, just to give it even more flavor than just water, um, but water suffices um, because you're pulling so much flavor out of the beans and the meats and the, uh, the mushrooms and everything, so. <laughs> listening to my uh seven-year-old yep uh, hey rowan. Like rowan come here it's your time to be on camera oh they're both coming oh, they're both coming hello hi there what do you think of the cassoulet do you like dad's cassoulet do you get hey do you guys like my cassoulet do you like this dish when i make it the sausage and the beans? Yeah, I'm not really a big fan of Oh, no, you're not? That's okay. How about a surprise? <laughs> <laughs> hey, one for two, ain't bad. 
He likes the sausages. He doesn't like the beans. I understand. We put him on the spot, though, and he wasn't thrilled about that. So I'll have to make it up to him afterwards. <laughs> Any last words of wisdom? Wisdom? No. Uh, well, I, you know, I, it sounds corny, but be good to each other, folks. Things are really rough for a lot of people right now. Um, one of the reasons uh, the charity that I chose is because, you know, again, it's a, it's a, it's a, a, a population that is so ridiculously at risk right now. Um, and, you know, they're at risk when things are at their best. Uh, and right now things are, are so suboptimal for everyone. Um, mm -hmm. Be good to yourselves. Uh, uh, we're, none of us are, are the best versions of ourselves right now with so many concerns in the world. So uh, that's it. Be nice to yourself. Be nice to other people. And thank you, Bryson, for the opportunity to, uh, to share this and to spend some time with you. I miss hanging out with you. Yeah, I miss you, man. I'm sorry I haven't been able to make it back on Tuesdays. It's been... <laughs> I, I, I was talking about in real life, not just Tuesdays, but yeah, oh, I yeah. mean. Dude, I understand. <laughs> like, I'll see you in 2021. I mean. <laughs> that's the plan. That's the, yeah, that's the plan. This year is over. Um, and uh, I'm sorry I haven't made it back to Cocktail Con in a little bit. Um, I've been I've been doing 16, 18 hour days. So usually I'm not off till eight or nine. And by that point, uh, I my default is I go right to the couch <laughs> with a drink. <laughs> and I just like. So uh, as someone who has worked himself into the emergency room twice, be good to yourself, Bryson. Take, well, I, take... still, I still manage to do yoga every day. So I'm, I am. <laughs> Which, by the way, you are welcome to join. Monday to Friday, I teach yoga. That, that's right. That's right. At noon, right? Uh, it's different on each day. Uh, like today okay. was at 30. Um, so it's it's different times on different days. Um, and it kind of moves around because some things I can't keep static with my schedule. Uh, but happy to yeah. have to bring you on. We don't do anything crazy. It's just a great workout with a small group of folks. And we're all there to encourage each other and, you know, just a good workout and some zen yeah i definitely need to work on the mindfulness more that's for sure i will send you an invite awesome well thanks again sir and thanks everyone for joining up and again uh i'm matching up to 500 dollars um i know uh, already that someone has put in 300 so i will be matching 300 on that um so please uh, I'm not matching up to $500 per donation. It's a $500 cap. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not that guy, unfortunately. Though if I would, I would be more than happy to be donating that much money. But yeah, post um, post your donations online, tag us, or send a DM if you want to remain anonymous. Um, yeah. Through these efforts uh, so far on the show, we've raised over $11,000. Um, next week we have Keenan Skelly coming on board for a completely different twist, where we're going to bake a cake. Now I am terrible at baking, so not only will you learn how to bake a cake, you'll get to watch me screw up baking a cake. <laughs> more awesome is she's already lined up a match up to ten thousand dollars in support of women's cyber jutsu. So that is a big deal. That is the best we've done yet. So we're all very excited for that. That is just that's awesome that we're all learning to cook together and making a difference in the community at the same time. Um, so. Uh, Carl, thank you for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. I'm honored. This was great. It was a lot of fun. Take care, everybody. Bye, everyone. <laughs>